This is a virtual tour of the Silk Road with Professor Clayton Brown. As you can see from this map, the Silk Road extended from Rome in the west to Xi'an, ancient capital of China, in the east. In 221 BC, the Qin Dynasty consolidated China's many warring kingdoms into a single massive empire. About the same time, the conquests of Alexander the Great linked societies from Europe to India, widening existing trade routes and forging new ones. Over the next several centuries, what developed was a complex trade network that spanned the Eurasian continent. Drawing from China silk, but also tea, porcelain, and jade, while gold, silver, fine glassware, and wine departed from Rome. Along the way, oils, salts, carpets, incense, and perfumes were picked up in the Middle East, while India yielded jewels, spices, ivory, sandalwood, and cotton. As we'll see, the route was 5,000 miles long and treacherous, but so lucrative that it lasted over a thousand years. Most importantly, the links that it forged were not only commercial but cultural. The Silk Road shaped every society within its vast network. Rome was the western terminus of the Silk Road beginning in the first century BC, so we'll start our tour at the Colosseum. The Greeks and Romans used huge quantities of incense to worship their gods, and so to serve that demand, trade emerged early on that passed through the Arabian Peninsula called the Spice Road, where frankincense, myrrh, and other exotic perfumes and oils were exchanged for copper, tin, iron, gems, and textiles. Spices came from as far away as India, and when the Romans acquired a taste for luxurious silk, the Spice Road expanded eastward into China and became the Silk Road. This is a Roman mosaic depicting a musician playing a pipe and a dancing girl wearing sheer silk robes. Our word silk comes from the Latin word Ceres, which is what the Romans called the people of China. Although the 13th century Italian merchant Marco Polo supposedly traveled the Silk Road to China, where he lived for 17 years serving Kublai Khan's court, few Romans actually made the trek to China and few Chinese came to Europe. Instead, trade relied on a series of middlemen who each took their cut, so that by the time the silk reached Rome, it was literally worth its weight in gold. Chinese silk became so popular that the Roman emperors instituted sumptuary laws that forbade commoners from wearing silk. Only nobles could wear this fine garment as a distinction of their higher status. Departing Rome, our first stopover as we follow the Silk Road is a famous site called Petra in the Middle East. We call this region the Middle East because it served as the middle ground between Rome and China in the Far East. As trade along the Silk Road grew, new commercial hubs emerged at strategic locations along the route. The most famous of these caravan cities is Petra, capital of the ancient Nabataean kingdom 2,000 years ago, but today its ruins lie within the country of Jordan. At its height, Petra's population of 30,000 played host to camel caravans bearing silks, perfumes, and spices from far away. Although today most of the city lies buried beneath the sand, many palaces, temples, and tombs carved into the sandstone cliffs remain. This is al Khazne, or the Treasury, a 12-story facade that was probably originally a temple. The word Petra comes from the Greek for stone, and is related to our word petrify. Due to Alexander the Great's conquests, which paved the way for the Silk Road, many of these cities used Greek as the common language. A common language facilitated trade, since those who traversed the Silk Road came from many lands and spoke many different languages. Al Khazne lies directly opposite the Sikh, a narrow but 250 foot tall natural canyon that restricted access to the city and thus provided some protection. If you've seen Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the film was shot on location at Petra. Although, of course, the events in the film are fictionalized, they basically used the actual site of Petra as a prop. Petra was gradually eclipsed by an oasis town to the north in the Syrian desert known as Palmyra. As people and money flowed through this city, it grew to become a major stopover along the Silk Road. By the 3rd century AD, Palmyra had become one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire, with as many as 200,000 residents. To serve Palmyra's cosmopolitan community, the city featured enormous limestone monuments common under the Hellenistic Age, such as temples to the various religions like the one that you see here. Roman urbanization projects also were responsible for the colonnaded streets down Palmyra's main thoroughfare, and you can see what remains of them here.
Following this main street then, you'll be able to see an open-air marketplace, the now empty square on the left side, and to the right a Greek-style amphitheater, which is the half-circle. The Colosseum was essentially two Greek amphitheaters back-to-back -back in a full circle. There were also banqueting halls and public baths, all in the Greek or Hellenistic style. Here's a 360 view of the Palmyra Amphitheater and the ruins out in the background. Islam would later come to dominate this region, and as trade along the Silk Road waned in the second millennium, so too did the once thriving oasis town of Palmyra. In the 17th century, a castle or citadel was constructed on the town's outskirts that today overlooks the ruins of Roman Palmyra. Located in today's northern Afghanistan, the city of Bamiyan was the last major stop for caravans before setting out to cross the inhospitable Central Asian mountains and deserts. At places like Bamiyan and Bactria, Hellenistic culture and language reached its easternmost point, and traders were confronted with a mix of Greek, Chinese, Indian, Persian, and nomad cultures found nowhere else in the world. Pictured as the great Buddha of Bamiyan, destroyed by the Taliban in 2001. Departing the city, these giant Buddha statues garbed in Greco-Roman style togas bade travelers farewell, and it was to these gods that traders would offer prayers for safe passage. They would need it. Caravans then funneled through the treacherous Karakoram Pass, a narrow gateway in the westernmost extension of the Himalayan range. The Karakoram Mountains hold the world's largest glacier outside of the poles, and K2, the world's second highest peak. Today, the pass is home to the world's highest elevation international highway, the Karakoram Highway, which follows roughly the same route traversed by these ancient traders. The nomadic warriors of Central Asia, such as the Kushan, maintained the passage and protected caravans passing through their territory, for a fee, of course. Moving through the Karakoram Pass, caravans would meet the Taklamakan Desert that fills the Tarim Basin. The Taklamakan is a cold desert, reaching at most 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, but nights are very cold, with temperatures below zero in the winter. Caravans would skirt the desert, hugging the foot of the Pamir and Tian Shan ranges and moving from oasis town to oasis town. You can still see the remnants of these oasis communities sandwiched between the mountains and the desert if you look for the blue lakes surrounded by lush green vegetation. In the heyday of the Silk Road, these towns thrived with inns, restaurants, administrative buildings, Buddhist temples and monasteries, residences, and even large estates with fruit orchards. But after about a millennium, the Silk Road was abandoned. Taklamakan, in fact, means abandoned place or place of ruins. According to local lore, sandstorms swept in from the desert and buried these towns in a matter of minutes, and over the past century archaeologists have indeed discovered temples and homes that have been buried under the sand for millennia, along with long-lost Buddhist scriptures, early Buddhist artworks bearing both Greek and Chinese influence, bricks of dried tea that never made it to Europe, and even the remnants of grape vineyards and peach orchards. The Tarim Basin was China's western frontier during the Tang Dynasty. Moving eastward, caravans would pass through Yumangguan, Chinese for Jade Gate Pass, which was originally a guarded outpost along the Great Wall constructed to oversee trade while keeping out the barbaric Huns and other warring nomads. Today, from atop this pass, one can still see relics of the Great Wall and beacon towers peeking out of the desert sands on the horizon. Jade Gate marked one's passage from the frontier into China proper. It got its name from the high-quality jade mined in the frontier and transported into China via this route. But of course, silk and other items made the journey through this pass going both directions. Pictured as a Chinese jade bee disc used for ceremonial purposes, 
Such disks were used since prehistoric times and could be tiny to several feet in diameter and several inches thick. The Chinese still highly prize jade. As merchants passed through the Middle East and India on their way to China, they brought with them their religions, first Buddhism, later Islam. So Buddhism was first established in the deserts of western China in oases like this one at Dunhuang. This is Crescent Lake near Mingsha Shan or Singing Sands Mountain, named for the sound of wind whipping sand across the dunes. It's all part of the town of Dunhuang, a frontier garrison that became home to an early Chinese Buddhist monastery supported by a large community of believers. For over a thousand years, Dunhuang preserved some of the finest examples of Buddhist art and scripture. Beginning in the fourth century, local patrons dug out hundreds of cave temples in the cliff face, each housing statues and colorful murals. It's known in Chinese as Qian Fu Dong, Caves of a Thousand Buddhas. When entering these caves, visitors are still greeted by Buddhist art that dates back as early as the 4th century. From large statues to frescoes to small Buddha icons, patrons would come here to give their devotions, saying prayers and walking in circles following the karmic wheel. The more wealthy would commission larger images, common people would have a small Buddha inscribed on a wall with their name, and monks and nuns would copy sutras, all of which would generate good karma. In the early 20th century, a hidden chamber was discovered at Dunhuang, where it seems that Buddhist monks, fearing the threat of destruction from Muslims, piled thousands of scrolls and then sealed up the secret room. These records now provide some of the richest information on the history of Buddhism. We're now heading to Rouyuan Tower at Jiayuguan Pass. Jiayuguan means pass through the excellent valley. It's the westernmost extension of China's Great Wall. For this reason, it was known to the Chinese as the first pass under heaven. All under heaven was a phrase referring to China, so the first pass under heaven meant the first pass Chinese travelers encountered that marked their return back into Chinese territory. Conversely, Jiayuguan had a more sinister reputation as the final gate that any Chinese who had been banished from the realm was ordered to pass through when they were exiled beyond the wall to live among the western barbarians. The city of Xi'an was China's capital in the Qin and Han dynasties, roughly at the time of the Greeks and Romans. As the Silk Road reached its height during the Tang dynasty, it transmitted not only silk and other precious goods, but also art and religion. First Buddhism from India, later Islam from the Middle East. From China's historic capital of Xi'an, Buddhism and other influences would extend into Korea, Vietnam, and Japan. At the seven-story Big Wild Goose Pagoda in the city's main Buddhist temple, the famous monk Xuanzang deposited sutras or scriptures he had retrieved from India. The city itself housed foreign residents of all kinds, traders, mostly Turkic-speaking peoples, but also Christians escaping persecution under the Romans, a small Jewish enclave with a synagogue, and then Muslims who built China's first mosque. Note the Arabic on the top of this arch. Today, the Great Mosque of Xi'an and the Big Wild Goose Pagoda still stand in the modern city, emblems of China's great cosmopolitan age. So although formidable mountain ranges, deserts, and oceans separated these civilizations, for a thousand years the Silk Road was the artery that connected the Roman and Chinese empires and brought into that circuit key communities throughout the Middle East and India, each shaping the others economically and culturally. <laughs> 